So this presentation is going to be on the tin-bearing pegmatites of Weiss, Namibia. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Finlay Goodwin. Uh, I'm a geologist. I did my undergrad at the University of Oxford, and I'm currently doing an MSc in mining geology at the Camborne School of Mines. What I'll be presenting today is my master's project that I did in my fourth year when I was at Oxford, uh, entitled The Tin-Bearing Pegmatites of Weiss, Namibia, which was sponsored by this company called Afritin Mining. So before I talk about the project, I'm going to talk a bit about the company that sponsored me. So it's Afritin Mining. Their flagship asset is the Weiss Tin Mine in Weiss in Namibia. Uh, it's a pegmatite-hosted tin, tantalum and lithium deposit with a jaw compliant resource of around 95,000 tonnes of tin, 6,000 tonnes of tantalum and about 450,000 tonnes of lithium oxide. So it's quite a large resource and this is just one pegmatite. And on the same mining licence they have at least 180 similar mineralised pegmatites uh, which they haven't drilled, they haven't got a resource on, so it really is a huge deposit. So the latest economic assessment of the mine puts it at a net present value of 87 million US dollars and 158 million US dollars, depending on whether the tin price would be 13,200 US dollars a ton or 19,800 US dollars a ton. And as of today, the tin price is around 25,000 US dollars a ton, so really we're looking at something north of 200 million US dollars in net present value. And the company is London listed uh, under the ticker ATM. It's got a market cap of 54 million pounds or 74 million US dollars. So the market cap obviously is at least underwritten by the net present value of the project as it stands today. Onto the, the project itself. So the project centered around mapping a 30 kilometer squared exploration license over the course of a month. Uh, with a focus on delineating and characterizing mineralized and non-mineralized pegmatite veins and then taking rock samples, uh, rock chip samples of these pegmatites and performing bulk geochemical analysis on them and using the geochemical data as well as the field data um, make an attempt to constrain the relative ages and the evolution of the pegmatites and where these pegmatites actually came from. And this is important because if we can understand where the pegmatites have come from, we can then sort of design our exploration campaigns based on that information. And so there are three main mythologies uh, you need to be aware of to understand this project. So there are the Monza granites and uh, pegmatites, which in turn intrude these green schist fasces meta sediments. So looking at these in a bit more detail, so the Monza granites are paraluminous. Uh, with a major mineralogy of quartz, albite, microcline, orthoclase, biotite, and muscovite, with accessory minerals of garnet, zircon, monazite, apatite, and tourmaline. And now the, the zircon and the monazite, as well as the apatite, are particularly important. I'll come back to this later. And the meta sediments, uh, they belong to the Amis River formation, uh, which is a green schist fasces uh, metamorphosed turbidite sequence, which consists of biotite schists and metamols, which are interbedded, as you can see in the image. Uh, at the top there, all been subject to ductile deformation around the time of the granite's emplacement, and they're also subject to alteration by pegmatites at the border of the pegmatites, mainly by tourmalization, which you can see in this micrograph at the bottom here. And so the pegmatites themselves, there are two variations. So the first is garnet tourmaline, which is non-mineralized at the time, basically the type that you wouldn't mine. Um, which is hosted by both the granites and the meta sediments in the in the license, characteristically non-mineralized, uh, with some alteration, and they're very crudely zoned. And the other type of pegmatites, they're niobium tantalum tin pegmatites, which is the same type that you see at the Weiss tin mine. They're meta sediment hosted only, uh, mineralized with respect to cassiterite, so tin, uh, and columbi group minerals like coltan. Um, they're heavily altered by means of gricinization, uh, so the uh, feldspars have been replaced by micro and quartz in some places, and they're characteristically unzoned. So just by looking at the sort of initial uh, field mapping, you can see that there's a sort of distinct uh, zonation of the types of pegmatites within the area. So you have this granite body down to the left here. And these pink veins are your unmineralized garnet tourmaline pegmatites, which sort of carefully mantle the, uh, the granite body itself. And then as you get further afield away from the granite body, you get more and more occurrences of these mineralized pegmatites. And indeed, if you 
plot the uh, sort of key mineralizing elements like tin and tantalum against distance from the nearest granite body, uh, you start to see that uh, the overall concentration of these elements generally tends to increase with distance from the granite. And so you can start to come up with this, um, uh, start to come up with a hypothesis where perhaps, you know, the granites could be the source of these pegmatites, whereby as a granite progressively crystallizes, um, a residual melt remains uh, where incompatible elements and crucially fluxing compounds like water, boron and fluorine become concentrated and for forms this pegmatitic melt that exhales from the granite itself. And so this melt would cause hydraulic fracture of the surrounding metasediments, uh, which would allow, allow the melt to uh, intrude into the metasediments and while all this is happening, the granite body itself would heat up the surrounding metal sediments and produce what's called a thermal aureole, which would allow the melt to progress further and further away from the granite. And as this happens, you get more and more concentration of boron, uh, uh, water and fluorine, which lowers the solidus of the melt and therefore allows it to travel further and further away from the aureole. And while all this is happening, um, you get to this sort of uh, end stage melt where you uh, have the concentration of basically all the incompatible elements in your granitic melt. So your mineralizing phases like uh, tin, tantalum and niobium, which will crystallize out as citrite and columbite group minerals in these niobium, tantalum, tin pegmatites. And so one way that you can test this hypothesis is without going into the geochemical uh, details too much, you can model how certain elements or element ratios might behave in a granite melt as it crystallizes. And so assuming that you start with a, uh, a, a granitic melt, which is denoted by this red NG point here, and assuming that all successive crystallization um, will consist of a mixture of a trapped liquid, uh, trapped liquid and uh, accumulate solid, um, you can produce two curves. So how different elements will um, sort of manifest themselves and how the concentrations will change in the, uh, the, the, liquid, the liquid phase. So this is the CL line and the crystallizing solid, which is the CS line. So if we're saying that these pegmatites have all come from the same parent melt, so the granite, all of these points should theoretically fit between these two lines, and by and large they do. You start to see something else that's also quite interesting. So as the melt becomes more evolved, you get more and more of these blue points, which are your mineralized pegmatites, with these non-mineralized pegmatites that form a sort of uh, middle ground between the mineralized pegmatites and the granite body itself. And so if you look at the rare earth element abundance, you actually see uh, the opposite. So rare earth elements, you'd generally tend to think of them as being what's called incompatible. So they prefer to uh, remain in the melt rather than the solid as a, as a magma fractionates. Yet you see that the granites, they're uh, actually, actually significantly enriched relative to the chondrite. And as you go from uh, granite to non-mineralized pegmatite and then to mineralized pegmatite, your total rare earth element abundance decreases. So this is sort of the opposite of what you'd expect to see. So we need to address this problem and come up with an explanation for it if the hypothesis is going to hold. <clears throat> and so looking at these partition coefficients, of um, various uh, rare earth elements into different minerals that you might expect to see in a granite. The partition coefficient basically just being a ratio of how likely an element is to go into a crystal rather than a melt. Um, you can see that biotite and K feldspar are generally below one, i.e. Uh, they um, if if a if a melt was just crystallizing biotite and K feldspar, you'd expect rare earth elements to increase in concentration in the melt. However, if you look at uh, these accessory minerals, so zircon, monazite, and apatite, 
they all have partition coefficients greater than one, some significantly so. And this is important because it explains why the Araith elements aren't increasing in concentration in the mineralized pegmatites. So you'd only need a, a tiny, tiny amount of monazite in particular um, to basically strip rare earth elements from the melt. And so you have to address the other side of the argument, right? So before I did this study, there was this guy called Warwick Fushlock, who in 2018, he published his thesis, which essentially argued that the pegmatites came from what's called an anatectic source. So that's direct melting from partial melting of the crust rather than progressive fractionation from a granite body. And these are just a couple of the uh, a couple of the arguments he put forward to explain this. So one thing that he came up with was field relationships. So he did a re regional study of these uh, pegmatites and found that um, there was no relation of the pegmatites to the granite body, uh, to granite bodies in the area. Well, on a, on a regional basis, that may be true, but within this specific exploration license, found that there's a significant field relationship between the types of pegmatite and how close they are to a granite body. And the other thing is spatial zonation. So if a pegmatite had formed just through direct anatexis of sedimentary source, you wouldn't expect to see any sort of uh, local zonation in um, mineral content. So you'd expect sort of mineralized pegmatites to be sort of interspersed with non-mineralized pegmatites. And that's actually the opposite of what we see in this um, in this mining license. And another thing is the size of the pegmatites. So generally speaking, if you have pegmatites that form from anatexis, um, they won't get to the sort of size that the Weiss mine pegmatites do. So that's just, yeah, it, it's another argument that basically points to towards um, the being sourced from a parent granitic magma. And finally, linked to that, you might expect to see migmatites. So migmatites are um, basically areas, areas of rock where there's been partial melting. Um, and you might see sort of pegmatitic, pegmatitic melts um, interspersed with what's called a restite. Um, and you just don't see any of those in the area. And so in conclusion, uh, presented this argument um, that all of the pegmatites in the area are a uh, result of fractionation of granitic melt from a single uh, parent granite uh, along the single liquid line of descent. But again, the, the con conclusions may not be uh, applicable to all pegmatites in the region. This is only done over a sort of 30 kilometer squared exploration license. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily rule out the origin from direct anatexis. So it's entirely possible that, say, deeper in the crust, uh, you had partial melting of a metasedimentary rock, and that partial melt used the thermal aureole of the granite to migrate and therefore form the zonations that we see in the field. And one way that we could really sort of put the nail on the coffin with this hypothesis is by dating the pegmatites and the granites themselves. So if they were a very similar age, you could basically conclude that they were the same generation. Whereas if you found that they were say 25 million years apart, um, they're obviously not from the same generation. Uh, so I actually had a few um, samples that were on, the, on their way to the University of the Witzwatersrand in South Africa to go and get dated. And um, they got lost in transit. So I'm sort of kicking myself here, but if we were to go back, uh, that was one one way that we could really test this hypothesis. So uh, thanks for your attention. Uh, I hope that was interesting. And if you've got any questions, let me know.